So today we're going to talk about something I feel like a, a lot of us, if you were like me, at least I didn't hear a lot about in medical school and it took me all the way through residency and as an attending when I realized I should know more about this because it impacts so many of our patients. So um, mainly opiate use disorder, but we're going to talk just briefly about some other substance use disorders. And my goal here is to think about how you think and care about these patients, really keeping your mind open to withdrawal symptoms, thinking about buprenorphine and understanding that a little bit more as well as why it works so well, and then starting to think about who's going to benefit from buprenorphine and what other things they need beyond just medication-assisted therapy to be able to succeed. So when I think about SUDS, it's actually one in 12 adults, and this is old data. So this is probably pre-COVID and maybe even higher now, but one in 12 adults had a substance use disorder in the past year. And when you look at this like 2017 data, um, it's just ridiculous, the, the number here, um, when you look at it and you can play around with the numbers and you can find higher numbers and lower numbers based on what subsets they're looking at. But it's really important because whatever you do, whether you go into a subspecialty, certainly if you're in primary care, if you're in the hospital, this is something that you will see and you will see a lot of. Um, and looking here, um, when we think about um, with and without opioids, we really have a lot of involvement of other medications in addition. We specifically in this area, when I was a resident, everybody was taking pills for their opiate addiction. And at and everybody was going to Florida. There was like the Florida pill mill, if you've like read Dope Sick or looked at anything. So people would go to Florida where there weren't really restrictions, get a ton of pills, drive them up here, sell them on the street. And when we really started to crack down, especially here with Casper, we didn't have that when I was a resident. When we started to crack down on that, people had to find other sources, which is when we saw heroin start to rise and we started to see all of the medical complications of IV drug use that we see currently. Um, but this is really just to say that we um, definitely see lots of co-ingestion. So thinking if somebody has one particular use disorder, you really want to screen and think about others, including um, opiates. And then looking here, these are kind of where we stand um, in terms of colors. So this is where we are in Kentucky with tobacco. We're in this, which I actually thought would be higher. Um, cocaine is not very common here. And then in Kentucky, we're still in that yellow zone. I think this is probably higher now. This was released in 2020. Um, so there you have it. But that's just heroin in age 18 to 25. So we've got much more potential kind of as people get older, but this is hopefully a group of people we see a lot of that we can make a really a big change on and they haven't actually already incurred a lot of the detriment of having their substance use disorder, at least from a medical standpoint. So why don't we talk about it more? I think it's because um, this is something that people have a lot of inherent bias about, whether it's the ACP saying that, or the ABIM saying this is important for us to learn. It's taken a long time for people to focus on it, whether it's medical schools um, focusing on it or even having enough you know, faculty who have experience to come and talk about it. And then um, people are scared about medication assisted therapy. It just, if you, when we first started here, nurses were concerned about it. Patients are sometimes scared and concerned about it. So I thought this was um, a different story, but it kind of reminds me a lot of like how if you've ever read about the beginning of the AIDS epidemic and how that came out, um, a lot of the same stigma and distrust, and it's still here today. Like it's not like we've abolished it or gotten rid of it in the past 30 years. But I think that when I think about substance use disorders, I think a lot about kind of that rise of care that we've had for AIDS. So really, I'd like you to compare the chronicle, chronic medical illnesses and what that looks like with substance use disorders and, and really think about it as more of a kind of relapsing chronic disease. Um, and it really does change your brain chemistry. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but you can see that there's absolutely physiologic changes that happen. Um, and some of it is certainly genetic. So when I think about it more as a chronic medical illness, that's how I've reached people. I know all of you are know these things, but it's sometimes you're gonna be talking about it to people who are family members or nurses and don't necessarily understand. So the stages of addiction, you wanna think of three really, and um, this is just super brief, but just to, to comment a little bit further on the brain chemistry changes. Um, really it's that binging, intoxication, the feeling of euphoria, people feel good often medicating for another reason. Then we start to have withdrawal and negative effects. So then you start to be preoccupied and anticipating the kind of next sense of high or euphoria. And as you go through here, you start to become um, 
mal have maladaptive circuits that are created here that cause you to not only have physical dependence, but have different, um, different neurotransmitters that are released. So this is why after you um, actually decide you want to be sober, it is potentially decades until your brain chemistry gets back to like normal senses of rewards, um, not having the same kind of ingrained behaviors. So it's really difficult. Um, even if you are on, you know, buprenorphine and going to do all the right things, your brain is not normal for years. Um, I wanted to throw this up because I noticed that you guys do a really good job. And if you'll notice me, it just happens that you're like, you know, alcohol abuse when you present. And I'll often just be like alcohol use disorder just because I think it does matter. Many of our patients, though, they will use phrases like addict. Sometimes they'll say things like junkie. I will mirror the words that my patients use in the room, but I always try, especially outside of the room around ancillary staff, to try to use some of the less stigmatizing language. Um, there's even a pledge you can take. Um, to like think about if you wanted to look at, at the words a little bit more or kind of take take it on to be an advocate for this. Um, yeah, and many patients will say clean, so I'll use that if they use it. But trying to say substance use disorder was a big change for me because like IV drug user is the number one thing you hear when the ED calls a patient up. So you write it on your paper and then you go to present the next morning, that's just what you read off. And I know that nobody means anything by it, but just is something to keep in mind. So we're going to follow a case. Um, this is a gentleman who's 42 years old. He has hypertension, known opiate use disorder. He last used heroin about eight hours ago, is coming in with severe back pain. Um, feel free to throw in the chat or just let me know what else you want to know. What would you ask him? How did he use? Yeah, so I, I ruined this for me because I put that it's intravenously, but yeah, that's important. Oh, fevers. Has he had fevers? Yep. What are you thinking there? Uh, yeah, epidural abscess, endocarditis. I mean, we know he has back pain, so I'd be thinking that. Where does he inject? Yeah, quantify what does severe back pain actually mean? Does he have any neurologic symptoms about going along with it? You guys are falling right into where I thought you would, which is like, this is the most pressing problem, obviously, and what you want to know from the ED. And you're going to do the exam and focus around that epidural um, abscess that you want to exclude. Um, the other things that get yep, acute or chronic. So the other things, and I'm sorry if this doesn't show up very well on the, on the Zoom. Um, would be thinking about substance use disorder criteria. So I think we focus a lot on that immediate um, back pain issue, but thinking a little bit more about this. And if he's floridly withdrawing or in severe pain, you're probably not going to get a lot about you know how long he's been using and what made him start using and has he ever tried to be sober before. But sometimes you can ask about recovery and things like that when you get into your social history. So these are the things that if you're on SUDS as a rotation or if you um, like when I follow up with him the next day, maybe he feels a little bit better. Some of these are the things that I want to ask to be able to actually diagnose the substance use disorder. And as you can see, a severe is like six of these. So pretty much most people that we admit here in the hospital are going to have at least six of these. So most of our people, when I bill for them, I'm going to bill um, either a moderate or a severe substance use disorder. So um, it's now 10 p.m. So he last used at 2 p.m. He says he's been using IV heroin for the last two years. Before that, he used some pain pills to help with chronic back pain. Uh, but then he was clean for a year. Um, he had some family issues happen, and he just didn't have a lot of support. And nobody would see him in the outpatient clinic to give him pain medicine again. So he started using heroin. No other substances he says he uses. He feels pretty straightforward, so you think you can trust him. He restarted. Um, opiates um, and since he restarted he's been slowly increasing the amount he's needed to use to get the same effect um, he says he is a daily um, opiate user and has never been hospitalized before but now he's homeless and without family support so if we went back and looked at that chart he'd like tick all the boxes there so now what are you concerned about overnight aside from doing the workup for his back pain and getting an mri withdrawal, withdrawal. so how are you going to manage that? Cows. Cows. Perfect. See, you guys already know so much more than I did in your uh, shoes. I don't even know if they had the cow score. Maybe they did. 
when I was a resident. So the symptoms of opioid withdrawal, um, and then there's certain PRNs for them. So obviously people can become anxious, hydroxyzine works semi well for it. I think if somebody is really withdrawing hard and they won't take pills, you can give it IM. It just isn't as, as fun. Um, and people tend to be able to tolerate about 50 milligrams or more. So some people you'll start with 25 because you don't want to snow them. Um, it's probably not going to have much of an effect. So check back again and make sure you increase it if you need to. Um, nausea, you can have Zofran. Obviously, you can have headache, um, aches. And those things would be well served by Tylenol, potentially ibuprofen if they have labs that allow you to. Diarrhea, um, you could just try loperamide. Insomnia is a big one because of these symptoms. So I guess you could try, you know, trazodone. Melatonin probably doesn't work. Um, most of these patients, if I go in and offer them melatonin when I'm on night float, they're going to like throw something at me. So probably don't want to just offer melatonin. Um, clonidine can be helpful with the agitation and tachycardia. I don't use a lot of methocarbamol, but it's there, it's a possibility. When you think about cow scoring, these are the kind of things they scored. Earlier this week, I had a patient um, and I walked in and he's been scoring, but um, we walked in and he immediately, I walked in, he had goosebumps and he was yawning and I'm like, oh, he's in fluid withdrawal. So um, I have to remind myself, don't just rely on the cow score in the computer. I can always go look at my patient and see if I have those objective things because this guy was also really anxious and had other reasons to have a headache. So it made it hard for me to say what was the opiate withdrawal and what was his underlying diagnosis. So those specific things that are really different, like the goosebumps, the pupils, the yawning are really helpful. Um, this is my plug to remind you guys there are a lot of withdrawal syndromes that we maybe don't even think about. So caffeine withdrawal, if you have a patient with headache in the hospital, ask how much caffeine they use on a daily basis. We can actually prescribe or make sure they get coffee in the morning if that's something that doesn't, um, isn't counter contraindicated for some reason because people can feel miserable. So here's the cow score, as you guys mentioned, um, clinical opiate withdrawal scale. It's 11 categories and it goes up to 24. We start to think about being in moderate withdrawal around eight. So that's the number you guys probably know the best because that's when you might be a candidate to start if you're starting kind of a full buprenorphine, not a microdosing um, initiation. All right, so you order the cow scoring and some PRN medicines. We do have this clinical um, opiate withdrawal scare. You can just order this when you type it in. However, we have this med opioid use disorder, which is going to give you the cow scoring. It's going to tell the nurse to call you when it hits eight. You're going to have all those symptomatic medicines we just listed. So hopefully this saves you some time. Um, I do try to write people... Um, if you're going to do both Sofrans, I'll put for the IV, like if cannot tolerate PO. So I think it's a good practice to just order both because then you'll save yourself or somebody else will call later because they can't tolerate the ODT. Um, so um, as you anticipated, the cross cover resident gets called overnight. He's got mild withdrawal. He's um, wanting to leave AMA. He just feels miserable. Um, so... This is the time I think that we start to think about buprenorphine and you guys have probably done this before. Um, I just wanted to put this plug in, especially in the outpatient setting. I think it's great to try to get people off of opiates. Um, in the inpatient setting as well, I'll see people who've been getting them probably and not helping themselves by it. Um, but there is actually a big warning for just sudden discontinuation. So often people will come in and you'll see things get stopped by other services. So just planning on um, having better discussions with your patients about what that's going to look like, because this is when people do, like our patient did, he, tend, he went to go find heroin because he was no longer getting his pain meds. So here's a time for medication. There's some different ones you can use. Um, my other plug today will be using naltrexone for alcohol. Substance use is um, really helpful, even if they don't completely stop drinking alcohol. It decreases the total number of days they drink alcohol and the amount they drink on the days that they do drink. It doesn't cause you to feel sick like disulfram or like antabuse where patients don't want to take it. So this can be helpful. Most people can be discharged with 50 milligrams orally, and if that goes well, they can get a long-acting injectable. Um, so that tends to work really well. The other ones here I haven't had much luck with. Both methadone and buprenorphine work well. I'm going to talk more about buprenorphine today because we can use it in the hospital. It needs less monitoring. It's relatively safe, and I think it's a little bit easier for most patients because they don't have to go to a clinic every day or multiple times a week. Um, and then for stimulants, so we do see a lot of meth. These are some of the things that I, I just went back and looked at the literature again. 
Um, naltrexone and bupropion together can be helpful. Mirtazapine, actually in somebody who has a history of anxiety or insomnia, tends to work pretty well for, for meth. So that is something I just read an article, a couple of articles about that I haven't used before, but I might start. And you'd want to use these medications in combination with some of these other um, other programs because the goal of MAT is really to allow you to promote it, um, to really engage in some of those recovery activities that you can't do if your brain is always thinking about, about your need and getting your next fix. So if we can do some of these things over here on the left, the hope is that we would see less abuse potential, less physical dependence, and greater safety, and that's exactly what the evidence shows. It's been used in France for decades. Um, it's something that still I give talks to hospitals across the country that are maybe more community, like I just did one at Owensboro for their family medicine residency. They still don't even have buprenorphine on their, like in their pharmacy, because there are places that still just, even though we have all this data, they've not prioritized it, nobody's asked for it. So it definitely works when you look at the buprenorphine, it's this um, blue line here. So you can see more people remain in treatment at the end of um, 160 days. We've got longer studies too. More people are abstinent, although that drops off. But even if you're not abstinent, being in treatment um, is, is a great thing because you're still where people can help you. And this is um, a study that I did with our pharmacists. So looking in 2018, we didn't really do any new Suboxone initiation. It just continued what was at home. In 2019, we started to use it and we were able to see um, how it impacted our discharges against medical advice. So in 2018, our rate was 14. It was 11 in 2019. I still don't think we're using it to the degree that we do now, but when you look at the people who were initiated on it, like it was just amazing how much that dropped even in the people in 2019. It went from 13% if they weren't initiated to 2% if they were. So how does it work? This is, um, this is the part I think that is the trickiest for most people. It's got a really high affinity. So it's gonna stick to your opiate receptor more than most other things, except for fentanyl. Um, it's really gonna stick there um, and it will displace other full agonists. So this is why it can precipitate withdrawal, why many patients don't wanna take it because they've had it before when they were, they still had full opiates in their system and it removed them from their opiate receptors, making them feel like crap. So that's why they don't like, if. So I can really talk through that with people. I just had somebody this week though, I couldn't get through to them because it's really hard to teach pharmacology to somebody who like didn't go to medical school really. Um, so that's really where our high affinity and the low activity is. So unlike methadone, which we use, which is a full agonist, you can continue to get increasing effects as you increase the dose. But since buprenorphine is a partial agonist, you get some effect, but you have a ceiling effect here, which is why you don't see many people who are gonna be on Suboxone greater than you know, 18 to 20 milligrams, and probably at 20, 24 milligrams, um, they're not really needing that much. They're probably feeling better with less, and that's when you'll see some people like, I know 12 will do me for the day, but my doctor gave me 18, so I know I can sell that extra tab on the street. And when you see people using buprenorphine on the street, it is not to get high. So remember, we're not really getting high here, especially if you have opiate dependence. It's more because they know that if they can't get their hands on a full opiate, that this is gonna help stave off the symptoms of withdrawal. So that's why people tend to use it on the street. It's not, it's not necessarily a euphoria. Um, and then it also has, a little bit of antagonist, but remember, because it's an agonist, we're going to treat it a lot like an opiate in some respects. Um, so there's different ways you can do it. Suboxone is what we're used to. That's buprenorphine plus naloxone. Stay tuned for naloxone. Subutex is just the buprenorphine. That's the brand name. So that would only be used in pregnant women. Um, and then there are patches. You can get sublocade. There are even implantables, just like kind of a Nexplan. You just get it in your arm. So it's going to have like a slow release of buprenorphine. So it really works within about 30 minutes. And here's what the most important part here is it lasts 24 hours. So you essentially should only have to take it once a day. However, if you're taking it for an analgesic effect and getting that little bit of partial agonies, um, that tends to wear off in about six to eight hours. So, so we'll talk a little bit about how to do pain control on patients with buprenorphine and we're gonna take advantage of that six to eight hours. So currently a DEA X waiver is needed to prescribe in an outpatient setting. I'm hopeful this will stop at some point. Um, in January of 2021, they talked about removing it and with the transition in our national government, they actually froze it because they wanted to make it stronger and give it more support. So it's still, 
still out there waiting to see. Um, I've like sent lots of letters and lobbied for the fact that I don't think it should be a, a specifically more controlled than any other DEA um, prescription because it actually is safer than a full opiate. Um, it's not going to cause someone to you know, die from an overdose like that will, but yet we still make people go through this training. It's usually an eight hour training. They give them several times a year in um, our Society of Hospital Medicine in August in Lexington. We have a full training there. You can also just do it online. You go to PCSS, you do your little modules, um, you fill it out. Even as a resident, if you do it, it'll count later when you get your DEA um, when you graduate. Um, and the way it works is you have um, like the first year you do it, they allow you to take care of 30 patients and you just keep a record of doing it. And then it moves all the way up to 100. However, inpatients admitted other than for opiate withdrawal syndrome. So if you're just admitting someone to detox, that won't count. But if they come in with this back pain, you do not need an X waiver um, to prescribe it while they're in the hospital. So where if you go on to be a community hospitalist and someone tells you you need an X waiver, that's not exactly true. Where you may need it is when they go to discharge if they need a little bit of a bridge prescription until they follow up. So naloxone is an opioid antagonist. It competes and blocks the effects of other opiates, including buprenorphine. So here's the kicker. Why we include it is because it's not really orally absorbed. So when you do your sublingual tablet with it, it's not something that will interfere with buprenorphine. Like buprenorphine is still going to work just the same. So the main reason that we add it is really to minimize the abuse of buprenorphine. So if you were going to crush buprenorphine and maybe dissolve it in some saline and inject it, then the naloxone will block the effect of it. So that's really why it's there. Um, and did anybody have questions about that? I feel like that was something I didn't understand for a long time. Hopefully that was easy to remember. So um, when we think about um, getting Suboxone started, I always think, is this patient a good candidate? So I want to think about what kind of drugs they use when they last used it. If they also use benzodiazepines, it can actually mean that they're a little bit more susceptible to that first dose and maybe um, react a little bit differently. If they use fentanyl, it may not displace at all. So, at, or if they use fentanyl, it might stick around a little longer. So I might want to wait for their counts to be a little higher so I don't put them into precipitated withdrawal. ADHD meds can do the same thing if they're stimulants. Um, and then I think about some baseline things to make sure they don't have significant liver disease. That's already probably been done for you here. And then a discussion with the patient as to whether they want to use it. And I would, I would recommend considering using it overnight to keep them in the hospital, even if they don't want to use it long term as an outpatient. It would be worth potentially starting so that they can get through withdrawal here and we can make a plan the next day. Um, and then, so mild to moderate opiate withdrawal, that cows of eight is when we like to start. Microdosing is something we don't do here yet, but if someone is going to be at a center or they were going to be in the outpatient setting and I had a week with them, you can actually start very small doses of buprenorphine and work up on it um, while you work down on your opiate. So then you don't have to be with, go into withdrawal because most patients don't really want to have a whole day of getting into moderate withdrawal before they start it. Um, so we use the cows. Um, this is the code for like our PDF here that kind of has some guidelines and some information if you ever need it. Um, if you're ever on service overnight and you can't find it in the workroom or you need it, um, feel free to text me or call me and I'll make sure that you get it. So we begin scoring, but we also put in our other medications. We've got our withdrawal. We're going to administer our Suboxone, typically with four milligrams um, sublingually and then reassess in an hour. So it's built into the order set that the nurse should reassess, but I think it also makes sense just to set a timer if you're busy at night in an hour or two to at least call the nurse and see how they're doing. Maybe the nurse has forgotten to reassess because what this is for is really if they're having precipitated withdrawal, you're gonna be able to give them more right away. So that's another two to four milligrams. The max in day one is usually gonna be eight to 12 um, milligrams. And I'll tell you the caveat here is that our for some reason, Cerner, instead of saying the milligrams, they say the number of tabs. So I might say two, like buprenorphine two or a two buprenorphine. That means two tabs, which would be four milligrams. So be cautious about that in both the order and when you look at the MAR. Um, so this is the power plan, um, buprenorphine naloxone. And it kind of follows this. Like when you have your cows greater than eight, you get your four. 
and then you keep rolling through here. And if you have a cows that's greater than eight again, you come down and you give more until you hit the end of day one. So you um, shot it, you sent a text to your attending overnight. They said Suboxone sounded good for this patient. Um, he had 10, so he was given four. And then in two hours, he had cows of eight, so he was given another two. He felt good, he slept overnight. In the morning, the team started Suboxone at eight milligrams at 8 a.m. daily. So this is the thing that I think also gets lost if you initiate overnight. Sometimes by the time the team talks about him the next morning, it's like 11 a.m. by the time they get to the room. So he's been back into withdrawal. Um, so I would um, consider mentioning it if you check out at night, like, hey, we initiated him. He's going to need his morning dose so that they could get it in and start it earlier. His nurse is concerned um, that he may overdose if he tries to use IV drugs in the hospital. So um, you can use, bring up some of these myths. These are commonly held um, that patients with opioid use disorder can get high from using buprenorphine. If you've never used opiates before, then yes, you will have some opiate agony that will cause some euphoria. However, in chronic opioid users, they really aren't gonna get significantly high from here because it's such a lower dose than what they're used to. Um, buprenorphine increases the risk of overdose. Actually, that's false. It decreases it because um, the high affinity will really block a lot of those receptors. The only thing it doesn't offer protection for is fentanyl. And then uh, a lot of patients themselves will say, you know, I don't want to be on something else and just change one addiction for another. Well, that's tough to talk about because we have such great data that people, especially when they're on it for life, will sometimes benefit even more than if they try to wean off even 10 or 15 years down the road. So I think it's a it's a chronic disease that requires chronic maintenance. Not everybody is on it forever, but so I always tell them, this doesn't mean you have to be on it forever. It's something that you're gonna need to continue to work on and see a doctor for forever. So the nurse feels better after you talked about that. Um, your patient's does well, but now he has an epidural abscess and it's gonna have to go for surgery tomorrow. So how are we gonna manage his pain? You've already started him on buprenorphine. Does anybody have thoughts? I don't know if I've got any. Zoom comments. Zoom is no longer showing the PowerPoint. Did you see that, James? You said they tried to call. Let me get that going. Yeah. All right, can my Zoom friends tell me if you can see this? Thank you. I'm sorry, friends. I will send the slides out so that you can have them afterward. Yeah. So good question. The um, the question there was since um, I talked about the fact that. Um, that when you hit, I think that's a better slide to look at, um, that if you're still high after the eight, you can reassess and give more. Um, you really, people rarely need more than this. You're, I'm right, you're right that you don't necessarily overdose or get overly sedated on here, but people are usually still getting, getting acclimated to it. So eight to 12 is usually where people like to stop. Most of our patients, I really rarely see anybody, if they were still having symptoms, it's not from opiates, it's usually from a co-ingestion. So I would encourage you if you're needing more than eight to 12 in the first 24 hours that you really think about whether there's something else complicating it. Um, so we think about this patient now who's going um, to surgery. So this is a struggle for many reasons. We think maybe we're going to have withdrawal because we displace, um, because we give full agonist, it might displace the buprenorphine. Well, withdrawal really won't because we've already got that buprenorphine sitting on our receptors. So the biggest risk for precipitating withdrawal is when you have full opiates and you put buprenorphine on and they knock it off. But if we have um, our buprenorphine's already here and we give full opiates, it's not going to cause withdrawal. Um, the concern then could be that the naloxone component blocks the effect of a full opioid agonist and naloxone shouldn't be absorbed. Remember, we talked about it's just there in case you try to kind of mis misappropriately use, inappropriately use um, the buprenorphine. 
And then there's more and more evidence. People used to think you couldn't give opiates on top of buprenorphine, but we have more and more evidence that even after surgery and you have bup on board, you can still use full opiates. You can use similar pain control, lengths of stay, functional outcomes. You're not going to have to get them reinitiated on buprenorphine later, which is even worse after surgery. I don't know if you guys have ever had somebody that went to surgery and then you told them down the road, like, oh, now we need to stop all your pain control for eight to 10 hours to get you into withdrawal, to get you back on buprenorphine. It does not go over well. Um, and so when you use opiates on top of buprenorphine, it will displace almost everything except for fentanyl, but other opiates won't displace the bup buprenorphine. It is a partial agonist, however, so you can still get opiate effects on top of it. Um, and when you do, you, um, you really want to think about the fact that they're going to need higher doses than the average person. So giving them like five to 10 of oxy may not be enough on top of their buprenorphine, right? We're trying to overcome that buprenorphine as well. So these are patients where 15 milligrams of oxy is usually about where I start. Um, so we would talk with them about it because I really want to think about what the patient's goals and expectations are, where they think we're headed with the outpatient world. Some people will say, I just don't ever want that again. So I might think about some of the other things, like can they get a regional anesthesia block? Are there um, adjuvant agents we can use that maybe don't require full opiates? But some people are like, no, I know I'm going to be in a ton of pain and I would like it. Um, so the other thing we could do before we talk about adding full opiates on would be um, we could start to schedule the suboxone um, either Q8 or Q6 hours and see if we can take advantage of that um, agony that tends to last six to eight hours. Um, and then if we needed to, we could add short-acting opiates PRN with higher than usual dosing and really clear expectations. So when do I not want to give buprenorphine, especially if somebody is on it at home? If I feel like there's an unreliable history of buprenorphine, um, and for this, we're actually going to hopefully get Casper as part of Epic or part of Cerner in the like, upcoming months. I think that's in the works because I know it's hard overnight. You can't necessarily look at Casper. Um, but pharmacy, clinic, call an attending. We can always pull up a Casper if you're concerned overnight. And there's always an attending on call that would be happy to respond. Um, if you're restarting in the hospital, if they've had good recent use history and they say they've not missed any days at all, you could just get initiated and they, their top screen is negative. So you really trust them that they took it yesterday. You don't necessarily have to wait for withdrawal. Um, and then I would hold it if they say that it's not working for them, they want to switch to methadone, they have something else. And if it's a really significant new liver disease, like in the high hundred, like two or three hundreds, um, if they have severe cirrhosis, obviously I wouldn't get started on buprenorphine or if they've been on it, maybe their liver disease has changed. You could discuss with SUDS and see if they're still a good candidate or if they should switch to methadone. So you talk to this patient. Um, he did not want to stop it and go into withdrawal and have to get back on Suboxone later. So he continued on the buprenorphine of eight milligrams. It was scheduled to every eight hours. Um, he still had breakthrough pain. Oxy-10 was added and that actually did work for him. So he's ready to go to acute rehab and we have to think about what else we need to do for him. Um, definitely for anybody with any substance, whether it's opiate or not, I prescribe Narcan at discharge and I send them, there's this Kentucky Harm Reduction Coalition, like a 60 second web, uh, website that has a video of how to use it. So I get that for everybody. And if they say they 100% are gonna be clean, they don't want it, um, they're insulted, you mentioned it, I just let them know, well, you know, other people might use it and it can save lives. So you should have it in your home. And I have one in my house too. And then they feel fine about it. Um, an outpatient clinic is so important. I'm so glad we have CORE here. Um, we know that having a referral to an outpatient program at discharge is a 70% reduction in mortality. Like I can't think of many medicines aside from maybe antibiotics that would reduce mortality by 70%. And yet nationally, only 20% of people discharged with uh, opiate use disorder actually get an outpatient referral. So we had the CORE program here. It actually started as a Kentucky opiate epidemic, opioid response something, I can't remember what the E is, about four years ago. And so that we had a grant for people and it was going to be end at the end of a year. And um, U of L Health was like, we actually think this is so important and it's been shown such a benefit that they funded the positions permanently. Um, and then if you're prescribing to bridge to clinic, somebody, either a hospitalist or um, like a SUDS team needs to have an X waiver to be able to cover them. So many of our hospitalists do. I think it's important to have, I think no matter what you do in the future, if you have it, if we still need X waivers in the future, at least if you feel comfortable prescribing it down the road without an X waiver, it's really important.
And then I just wanted to say, if people are going to rehab, it's really interesting to me. Uh, both acute and subacute rehabs get to kind of cherry pick who they will take, and many of them will not take patients. I had a patient just here with methadone who I know is not going to do well at home, but nobody would take her. It feels risky to them. I think they also have a lot of bias that those patients are going to be higher need or cause more trouble or have other behaviors that they don't want in their facilities. And they, there have been some class action lawsuits about it. And it turns out they really don't care. They'll just pay whatever money they need to. And they're continuing to, um, the big chains at least, that were the ones that were sued are continuing to still have those discriminatory practices. So I was going to give everybody a minute to um, just chat with your neighbors. Like, what do you think we need to do next here at UofL? Like, here's a couple of areas. Um, but I'm curious about what you guys think would be helpful for this patient population or for our education around it. So chat with your neighbors. If you're on Zoom, feel free to pop it in the chat. If you're at the VA, chat with your, your friends there. So I'm going to repeat for everybody at home. Um, Ariel talked for a second about how it's really hard and it stinks to kind of have this so late in the year, especially when some people come in and didn't have it really much at all in med school. So that was part of why I wanted to make sure we recorded this. I would like it to be a part of the boot camp that got sent out like that. Louisville Lectures Boot Camp series that got sent out at the beginning of the year. So then if people felt like they needed that, they would at least have the video, even if we can't schedule it sooner. Ideally, I would love to become a DEA X waiver trainer and be able to offer training twice a year. Um, we just had one that was virtual. I'm on the Society of Hospital Medicine for Kentucky chapter, and we just had um, had one that was virtual. So that would be something like down the road, stay tuned. I'll put it in the news if anybody wants like extra training or to, to get that waiver. Anybody else? Education for surgical services. Thanks, Ryan C. Um, I don't know if they want my input on that, but I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> um, it has been nice because when we initially got the core social workers, they were really just for medicine. So I do feel like they're utilized at least. And so they actually, the surgical services have some of their own um, social workers and so, do, so does OBGYN that are really focused on this and passionate about it. And so they are doing good work. I think it's just, um, Again, it's very provider dependent and team dependent and you know, ortho is different than trauma. I feel like trauma sees a lot of it. So some of my trauma colleagues do a really good job and are very into it. Um, some of them are less so. Yeah, Claire. Yeah, great question. What if what if anesthesia wants to give fentanyl to somebody? Um, so the the problem with doing fentanyl is that it will displace it. So if you think that they're safe from an overdose, they won't be. They can still have fentanyl given to them. They're not going to have a problem with it. It will displace a little bit, so it could reset them. So I try to talk with anesthesia um, if you know, they're going for a procedure. I, I usually just call the anesthesia. I try to figure it out myself and say, hey, like we're concerned about this. Can you try something besides fentanyl? Because there are other options. But you're right, they don't always think about it because they're so used to it. Like, or if they're going for a colonoscopy, like that's just what we're used to doing. The management of surgical patients is um, definitely being echoed over here at UofL. I think getting it stopped, and it's it's difficult, right? And every the surgeon kind of has to be the person because they're doing the operation and the anesthesiologist. But yeah, maybe we could do some more like multidisciplinary like cross conferences and get, make people feel safer about putting opiates on top of it. Um, I think there's a lot here. Um, to look at. And for me, like Narcan, I think that's hard. I couldn't put it when I built the order sets, I couldn't put it into either the starting Suboxone or the starting the symptom medications because you can't put discharge prescriptions in there. So I even forgot it on a patient of mine this week and I had to send it to their pharmacy and call them and tell them it was there later. Um, I also think doing Suboxone microdosing is something that we could think about if somebody's going to be here longer um, so they don't have to withdraw. And then using Depot or having a good source for people to get, you know, an injection before they leave might really uh, benefit them. I would love to have, I know we have a SUDS clinic now, which is great, um, but being able to even provide bridges over in our AIM clinic while people are kind of waiting to get in, I think could be amazing. So I'll move this if you wanted that. This is just a, a quick PDF. I have more resources. Like I have a patient handout that I give some of my patients. I have a family handout that talks about how they can support people. So if anybody wants more of that, I can give it to you. But hopefully um, you can help destigmatize SUDS, especially I think it's not us. It's more like either nursing staff or you'll hear other services. So just gently like 
even if you don't feel comfortable correcting their language, like choosing the right words when you respond back to them can make a difference. Making sure you're monitoring for withdrawal and taking really good substance use histories. Um, remember that buprenorphine um, is so evidence-based and can definitely save lives as can referral in the outpatient setting. Make sure everybody gets a Narcan prescription at discharge. Um, if people are coming in in acute pain and they haven't missed their buprenorphine dose, it's okay to continue it. Um, and you can either adjust their total daily dose or their dosing um, or even talk with SUDS. And, and I think every attending is a little different too with their comfort level. Some people, even in our medicine department, will say, just call SUDS. And that's okay. Um, but my hope is that we can all like become at least a little bit more comfortable so we can manage until you get SUDS or I know that they're really busy too. Um, shameless plug, we do have a substance use disorder rotation that Dr. Gordon and I um, run and people have really thought that it's been helpful. You get to spend some time with SUDS, you get to go to some recovery meetings, um, just kind of learning a little bit more in depth, um, people have enjoyed. And there's some like downtime to do your DEAX waiver training, you get protected time for that if you're interested. And here's a bunch of um, resources. Here's a letter if you wanted to send to a congressperson as to why you think X waivers are no longer needed. SAMHSA is really useful for both patients and ourselves. PCSS is um, where there's some great training. And this is a great, super quick, super easy article if you wanted to look it up at things we do for no reason um, to kind of get some quick talking points if you ever needed to re remember it yourself. And that's all I've got.